are, however that is, we'll love you. I like to say it this way. We're all weird, just in different ways, all right? And so let's be weird together. Um, real quick, before I jump into this, I, I just request your prayers. I'm leaving Tuesday morning for Uganda. Uh, when I accepted the lead pastor role here just at two years ago now, I brought with me an organization that I found called Return Hope International. And we have work that we're doing in Bujiri, Uganda, where the average person makes 40 cents a day. Uh, before I ever became a pastor here, this church, Christ Church of Fountain Hills, supported and helped us begin to build a school facility in Uganda. It's going to hold about 750-ish students. It's four stories tall. We're finishing up this year the fourth and final floor. And we're planning on, as Christ Church does every year and has, I think, almost since its beginning, at the very end of the year, the last Sunday of 2018, we'll, we'll take a uh, sacrificial offering. We just would encourage everybody, consider, maybe you don't spend quite as much on, on Christmas presents, you know, this year, and you save up, and there's a year in, just a thankful offering. And 100% of that is going to go to help us finish our building. And it's not just on Christ Church. We have individual investors, and we have people you know, in other places as well that help with that. But due to the fact that I used to go about twice a year, I haven't been in almost a year and a half now, and I just need to get over there. And it's funny, it's, I'm going to actually, in a Tuesday to Tuesday trip, I'll be on the ground only three days, flying four days. I, I'll fly from here to five hours to New York City, New York City, 10 hours to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Rwanda, 10 hours, sit on the plane for an hour, one final quick flight into Entebbe, Uganda. And it is brutal, painful. I'm not going because it's fun. I'm going, some of you had met Oketch Sam. He's our director on the ground over there. And uh, if you live in Africa for any period of time, especially Uganda along the equator, you're going to have malaria. We well, has malaria. And I had some people send pictures and literally Sam was on his deathbed. And malaria had hit him so hard. It comes and goes, and they take medicine to control it, but sometimes it just catches him. And had it not been for a couple strangers, they found Sam wandering around almost out of his mind. Malaria does funny things to you. And he would have collapsed and probably died somewhere, and they picked him up and carried him to a regional hospital. And I just got to get over there and verify all that, make sure he's doing okay, make sure our work is doing well. Again, I'll be there three days on the ground. Due to, I'll try this, no promises, because we have this phrase when we go to Africa, this is Africa. Nothing is guaranteed, timing-wise, Wi-Fi working, anything like that. But because it's 10 hours ahead, I will try to get some footage on video, maybe even on Sunday morning, next Sunday, because uh, it's 10 hours ahead of us. I'll video some things, maybe some announcements, and I'll get it sent over here, pray the Wi-Fi works, and you guys will do a, a welcome from Uganda kind of thing. But just I, I don't do that a lot. Request your prayers. Pray that I get out of my chair and stretch a little bit. It is a brutal, painful 24 hours of flying. And anyway, it's about 36 hours before I actually get there with all my layovers. So it, all I'm doing is requesting your prayers. Um, in this message today, we've, we've just finished a series last week, seven parts, called Brick in the Wall. Don't be a brick in the wall kind of thing. And we've been going through this message series that's titled Inspired, and we break it up into these little packages. Today's a standalone message is what I'm trying to say. And it's a, I don't pick the order of the passages we're covering. We just started in the beginning of Matthew, and we're working our way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're in Matthew chapter 24 today. It just happens to be the date and the order of it. This passage kind of talks about the end. If you ever want to just sit, so I'm going to, typically we'll have a stand out of a teaching or command of Christ just while we read it out of reverence, but I'm just going to have you sit and I want you to listen and absorb. I'm going to read two lengthy passages, but they're descriptors. I mean, this is intriguing stuff, I hope to you. Descriptors of the end. When God the Father sends Jesus, what's it going to be like? What's going to happen well, we get that in Scripture, and so would you just sit back and listen to this. The message title today is The On-Time God, and just hang in here with me. We'll build to the three simple points today, but let's just start reading. Peter is one of the great apostles. He does some writing in the book of Second Peter about the end times, and then I'm going to back it up by reading something that Jesus says to verify it all. Peter writes, this is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember 
what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, what's it going to be like? And are we in the last days? As we just pause and think a little bit. He says, in the last days, scoffers, scoffers, we don't use that word very often, scoffers will come. They're going to mock the truth, following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately, Peter writes, forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out from the water and he surrounded it with water. A little, a little wisdom and look at creation. And then, this is Noah's ark time, he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth, where we live right now, are being stored up, have been stored up for fire. They're being kept for a day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. It's kind of talking about what's going to happen. It's this kind of, I think as we read through this, it's exciting and comforting and terrifying at the exact same time. It's a mix of emotions. So stay tuned in with me here. In verse 8, and this is where we'll spend just three quick points when I'm done reading these lengthy passages. You must not forget this one thing, Christ Church. A day to the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The on-time God is the message title today. Verse 9 goes on, Peter writes, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise in returning, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. I've shared with, I think most of you, you may be new, I have, I have some religious roots in Catholicism and how I kind of grew up. wasn't very committed in it, you know. I would have called myself a priester. I went on Christmas and Easter. And, uh, but I was brought up in the specific, with the priest that I learned under, I was kind of scared of God, terrified, grouchy old grumpy God kind of thing. And the longer I'm out of religion, which Jesus can't even stand religion, he came to bring a relationship for all of us, to bridge the gap. He, he didn't so much die for you and me, he died in our place. You know, we're the ones who deserve the death. And that, when I think about God the Father who sent Jesus, boy, I don't see a grouchy old guy up there. I see a very loving, kind patient, somebody who, who really wants me back in a walk or a relationship with him, like a loving, perfect father and a great son or child, an incredible relationship. That's the kind of God we serve. Don't buy the lies of whatever else you hear out there. And the reason he hasn't just come and destroyed everything already, because I don't know, me, I lack patience and I, I deal with anger issues and sometimes in my life and I do a pretty good job of self-controlling it nowadays. But the reality is if I'm God, if I'm Jesus sitting next to God, I'm like, good, good God, literally. Good God, how long are we going to wait? You see what's going on down there? That world has lost its mind. Why don't we just, let's just go fry it all. But thank God I'm not God. Thank God that I'm not Jesus. It says he's being slow, he's being patient for my sake and for your sake and for somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus yet sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. But it does say, the day of the Lord, though, when it happens, when Jesus returns, will come as unexpectedly as a thief. The heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. I don't know what that would be, but it says other passages talk about the sky folds up. It's kind of crazy. The heavens will pass away with the terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. And since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, Peter writes on, what holy and godly lives we should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. You know when you're anxious about something? You think about it a lot. It overwhelms you. Anxious means you're kind of hurrying it along. You're like, you can't, you can't quite stand it. So maybe if you don't remember anything else today, here's a little side note. Maybe I would encourage you to get into the practice of whatever it is. I love how Denzel Washington says every night he picks out his shoes before he goes to bed and he puts them under his bed. So when he gets up in the morning, he has to get down on his knees 
and get his shoes and he rem he's reminded then to pray to the Lord and to give him thanks and to say, maybe today, Lord, you're coming back. Maybe you do it that way, maybe you don't. Maybe each morning you get up and you look out the blinds or out the front door, back door, whatever it is. We live in a beautiful place called Arizona. And you get up and you say, maybe today, Lord. Maybe today is the day where you come back. And if he doesn't that day, just before you go to bed, maybe you look outside the window and think to yourself or go out the backyard for but a second and just say, maybe tonight, Lord, maybe tonight. And that expectancy that would probably be a reminder to each and every one of us to live our lives, as Peter says, what holy and godly lives we should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. And then he says with some description, on that day, he will set the heavens on fire. It's hard to imagine. And the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and a new earth that he has promised. Everything will be burnt off and restored and renewed. A world filled with God's righteousness in the new heavens and the new earth. And he finishes up. And so, dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. That's a good God. A little bit of a window of what it might look like when Jesus returns. But Jesus has a segment that's the actual teaching of command we're covering today that I'd like for you, please sit back and just listen, you know, and let's read some scripture on this Sunday morning. Matthew 24, Jesus says this, if anyone tells you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it, he says, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise up, perform great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen people, believers. That's 2,000 years ago this has been written. There have been false prophets rise and fall over and over and over. Jesus' warning is proving true. He goes on and says, so if, if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, Jesus has returned, don't bother to go and look, or look, he's hiding over there, don't believe it, for, is what he says, as lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes, when the Son of Man returns, when Jesus returns. You will not have to wonder if Jesus is returned. He teaches us that everybody will know at the exact same time. I've, been, I've had atheists challenge me personally, say, it's impossible. How could somebody on this side of the planet and this side of the planet, if the earth is round and Jesus returns here, how will they know? Well, come on, I can use technology and call somebody in Japan right now, or I can be watching TV and at the exact same second, somebody on the other side of the planet be watching the exact same thing. If we can do it as mankind, I don't think God who created the sun, the moon, and the stars has any problem letting the world know he's returned, period. Verse 28, it goes on, and just as the gathering of vultures shows there's a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. And he talks some more in chapter 24 about what signs. There's other sections in Scripture where the apostles back him up and say, these things are going to be happening, you know, as, 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 as a preface of Jesus returning. So we won't go into full details. I trust you're, you and I are reading our Scriptures every day. Verse 29, immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun's going to be darkened, it says. The moon will give no light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. He goes on, and then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens. Nobody knows exactly what that's going to be. There will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. What does that mean? Can you imagine in our social media world, in our television world, there are some people, and I don't hold anything against them. My heart aches for them. They're so cynical about Jesus. You know, say, may, may as well believe in unicorns. They'll say things like that. And, and they just have a deep cynicism about them. Now imagine, and I always fall back on this, because I try to approach all of that with humility and try to keep people's hearts open for learning, help them stay disciples. I don't want to say something as a follower of Christ that closes people who don't believe in Jesus' heart. They don't, they'll close their hearts. I don't want to do that. So I'll say this. Well, if Jesus is who he says he is, say that a lot to people and I hope it stirs you to pause and think because do you really believe it do you believe these passages they're strange 
you go through and you read through the scriptures, are, are these reliable? Is the scripture reliable, trustworthy, true, pure, perfect, as Christians say it is? Well, I don't know if you know or not, but just keep this in mind. Forty different individuals were all a part of writing this. Every other religious scripture out there is written by one person. Forty individuals. Now, these 40 individuals who wrote the scriptures that we have before us today, they lived 1,500 years time span from each other. And they lived on three different continents. These people didn't know each other. And their recordings, 40 different authors, 1,500 year time frame, and three different continents, they all wrote the exact same things, the same details, the same story. It's fascinating. And you have to determine in your heart, don't let anybody shove it down your throat, whether or not you want to believe it and have faith in it. And, and be reminded that the, the writers of the scripture, and Jesus even says, you got to have faith like a child if you want to be my follower. I don't use the wisdom of the world, the ways of the world, all those with knowledge. I don't use that. I use the foolishness of the world to prove my ways. And then only God gets the glory. But now imagine a group of people who are so cynical and sarcastic and nasty. They try to humiliate people who are believers or have faith. Imagine at that moment where they all of a sudden realize Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, the one I've been making fun of all my life and dogging people like crazy. Here he comes. Imagine there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. I will not celebrate that day. I will not celebrate when the people who chose to be cynical and didn't believe, when they are separated, that's not a celebration. It breaks my heart. It really does. That's not a triumphant day where I point a finger back. I weep for those people. Nobody deserves eternal separation from their creator. But God's the one who drew that line. And so let's keep, let's keep reading through here. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels. Here's what's going to happen when Jesus returns. It says he sends out his angels with a mighty blast of a trumpet. I was hoping it would be electric guitar, but a trumpet's fine. And they will gather the angels, commanded by Jesus, will gather his chosen ones. Who's that? There aren't special chosen ones. His chosen ones is terminology simply for those who have given their life to him. For those who have said, I believe you are Lord and Messiah of my life. To those who diligently get up each day and say, I want to follow you, Lord. Help me in my imperfections. I really want to believe in you, Lord. Help me with my doubts. And that's a good and patient God, and that's a good place to be when these angels begin to gather. And says that the chosen ones from all over the world from the farthest ends of the earth in heaven. Heaven's a very racially diverse place, eternally. Now learn a lesson, Jesus goes on and says, from a fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer's near. In the same way, when you see all these things, and you have to read the scriptures, where multiple passages talk about what happens for signs of the end of the times without being a weirdo, Christian wacko, saying those things. Lots of scriptures in reference to that. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know that his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things takes place. You want to go, hold on, Jesus, what do you mean? That was 2,000 years ago. Well, careful with translations. It really should be translated here. I tell you the truth, this age will not pass from the scene until all things take place. What does that mean? There's three ages in the timing of God. You've got the Old Testament scriptures. And that's where God, the Father, so you've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three people, three ages, if you will. God showed up in the flesh, communicated in all kinds of amazing and crazy ways through the Old Testament. I love reading the Old Testament, at least most of it. Some of it, you do some speed reading through. If, you know what, if you've read through the scriptures of the Old Testament, you know what I mean. But there's some amazing, powerful movie scenes, if you will. And then you have the age of the... Of, the son, Jesus himself, where it's just a 33-year short period. There's a 400-year period where God the Father is present, and for 400 years he goes silent. No appearance, no communication with man at all. Time of the prophets, terrible times, terrible times in this 400 years of silence. And then Jesus is born. 
And there's a 33-year age where Jesus is here amongst us in the flesh. We're of the last times, the age of the end time, the Holy Spirit, where it's a little bit more challenging in my opinion. I've been jealous of the Old Testament where God showed up in pillars of fire and, and clouds of, of smoke during the day or a voice or you see rocks split open and, and he was there present with them. Or to actually see Jesus bring Lazarus out of the grave or to heal the rich man or to, see, to heal, to heal the, the, to heal. And, and uh, you know what I mean, to be there in the flesh and to actually see Jesus and touch him and hear him. We have the, sci the sci-fi age, the Holy Spirit, the strangest, in my opinion, of the three, but just as powerful and amazing. And we're the ones that the Holy Spirit indwells us. It says he lives in you. And that's the age we are currently in. So if I keep reading through this, I tell you the truth. This age will not pass from the scene and all, until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear. But my words will never disappear, Jesus says. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. We can only see signs of maybe things beginning to happen. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven. Not even the Son himself. Jesus doesn't even know when he's going to return. You've seen the billboards of these people coming out and say he's returning today. Here's the date. These people are crazy because Jesus doesn't even know himself. The Father is the only one who holds that information. Only the Father knows, Jesus says. Verse 37. And when the Son of Man returns, it'll be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. But not if you get up each morning and say, maybe today, Lord. Not if you go to bed each night and say, maybe tonight, Lord. That's the way it'll be when the Son of Man comes. Verse 40, two men will be working together in a field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. You hear Jesus teaching, the angels have taken the one. The other one's left behind. What are they left behind for? Destruction. God's going to burn everything down completely and start brand new and fresh a new heavens and a new earth according to the scriptures the other left so you too christ church keep watch you don't know what day the lord's coming understand this if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming he'd keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into you also must be ready all the time for the son of man will come when least expected a faithful sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. What's that mean? Jesus is left. He's the master. God the Father gave him all authority in heaven and earth and under the earth. So Jesus leaves and he says, hey, everybody, go into all the world. Make learners of people, disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says things like, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, take care of the orphan and the widow, be kind. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he says, by the way, I'm going to return and we'll just settle the score. And to, to those who are faithful, I will honor. Well done, good and faithful servants. And to those who are not, here's what he says. If the master returns and he finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks... My master isn't going to be back for a while. You'd be amazed how many people have said to me, especially when I was a youth pastor, back in the day when I had hair. They would say, Trent, I'm not ready to be serious yet. I just want to have fun. Jesus isn't coming for a long time. I just want to play around for now. Can you imagine? Take that mentality with a thief, being prepared anyway. The master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant's evil and thinks, my master won't be back for a while? He begins beating other servants, partying, getting drunk. He says the master is going to return unannounced and unexpected. He will cut that servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's crazy. Inspiring, encouraging, and terrifying at the same time. So I want to just make a quick point. God's clock is not our clock. The day of the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years to the Lord is like a day. Try to wrap your brain around that. And I could spend just the rest of our time, I could spend hours actually hypothesizing all that stuff we just read. 
about signs and here's the things that are going to happen and we could, we could go pour in through revelation and we could break it down and we could spend all kinds of time trying to predict when Jesus comes back, but all I would be doing was adding to the noise. In the real world, in people who are far from God, nobody cares about what the book of Revelation says. Most people don't care about what the Bible says. They think it's a farce. It's a fictional story. So here's the deal. What do they care about? They care about, do you love me? Do I matter to you? Are we going out in the world and representing that kind of Jesus? We could hypothesize a lot of things about what you want to believe about the books of the Bible, but the reality is this. Just be ready. Jesus is real. What he says is going to happen. And each and every day, out of joy and a form of positive anxiousness, hurrying it along, asking God to make it happen. So what do we do in the meantime? Here's real quick. Let's finish this out. Three quick points and we're done. What are you going through right now? I find most people have something challenging ahead of you. I do. You have struggles every day of things that you're just going through, that you would prefer they not be there. And you're almost in a hallway, a waiting game, wondering what God is going to do next. Dreams, hopes, goals, right? We're all there. So what do you do when you're in this position? Listen to this story. In 1961, I was born in 1970, so I Googled this, okay? In 1961, Roger Maris broke Babe Ruth's home run record in one season. How many of you were alive and remember that story? I'm not calling you old. That's just kind of cool, all right? I wasn't born yet. 61 home runs in one season, and I'll add on a side note, and he did it without any illegal substance usage. You'll have to research the story yourself. I read about it and how hated Roger Maris was for breaking that record. That was news to me. I'd never heard that. Somebody, a reporter, asked him, what's his secret to hitting 61 home runs in one season? You know what he said? He didn't talk about power. He didn't talk about strength. He didn't even talk about bat speed. He said the secret to hitting home runs was split-second timing. And he went on to say, the secret to hitting a home run is to hit it right on time. Think of that, right on time. One of the greatest predictors of God is the simple fact that he's always right on time. And isn't it frustrating when it's not your time? Or am I just speaking for myself? I would prefer God respond to my timing, if you ask me. But his time is always right on time time. He's never early. He's never late. Always stinking right on his time. He's an on-time God. EST, you could call it, does not stand for Eastern Standard Time, but Eternal Standard Time. And it's a frustrating time with me. There are many kinds of churchy phrases out there, not good or bad, just phrases that people use to encourage us to hope through all circumstances. Things like, and, and it's part of the reason why we showed some of, of the video, now, the phrases we Christians come up with, I think, sounds, makes us sound like total foreigners, a bit strange to the unchurched world. Until God opens the next door, I'm going to praise Him in the hallway, you know. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Uh, don't mistake God's patience for His absence. His timing is perfect. His presence is, con is constant. I mean, there's so many things that be, when God closes a door, He opens a window, you know, and I'm, I'm just like... Bleh. I had somebody say recently, as we had a small moment where we thought we had a health scare with my wife, and, you know, when that kind of thing happens and doctors can't find anything, the worst thing you should do is read the internet. You know, my gosh, he was dying in like six months kind of situation, and, but it was a scary time, and I had a person tell me, a gentleman say, you know, no matter what happens, even if she dies, it'll make you tougher. <laughs> and it, it's the closest I've wanted to punch somebody in the nose my whole life, you know. We say funny things in awkward moments. It's not right or wrong. It's just we'll keep working on being real, Christ Church. So it is frustrating. Here's my point. It is frustrating not knowing the next step God has in mind for you. What he's trying to work out in your life. It's so frustrating. So what do you do while you wait? I know the Bible says that not worry about tomorrow, trusting in God's timing. I get all those good intentions, speeches all the time. I understand the Bible verses that say that, but I hate the waiting game. It is not fun at all. I hate it. 
It's something I know God's working on with me. So here's what I think we have to do first. No matter what you're going through right now, first thing you should do is thank God for the season. The Bible tells us in multiple places, give thanks to the Lord, rejoice always, think about the things that are lovely and admirable and worthy of praise. Then the God of peace will be with you. Uh, James writes, even when you're going through trials and tribulations, give thanks. You would go, are these people crazy? But they're right. And, and just think about this. It's different to thank God for the season than it is to thank God for the circumstance. I can't imagine somebody tragically losing their teenager in a car crash, and I've done the funerals, and they're so thankful that God took their child. No, that's not what I mean. But you can thank God in the season. You can thank God for the season. And the next two points will back that up, but let me, let me verify a couple Bible passages about this. First Thessalonians says, be thankful in all circumstances. That doesn't say for the circumstance. In the circumstance. I promise you, I've, I think I've been doing this ministry thing long enough, 27 years now, where you and I could sit and talk, and if you're going through, you name the most incredibly tragic thing you could possibly experience or are going through right now. So come sit and talk with me. Let's have a cup of coffee or Dr. Pepper with a squeeze of lime, if you haven't ever tried that. And let's spend 30 minutes together. And I promise you, we can find good in anything. Why? Because the Bible says so. God says so. And if you and I put our heads together, even the most tragic things, we can find good in them and things to be thankful for. I promise you. Be thankful in all circumstance. This is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He's done. So give thanks to God for the season that you're in. What's your other option, old grouchy pants? What's your other option? It's about controlling and self-discipline inside, being the kind of person you want to be. Second, tell God, thank you for what you are teaching me in this season. Ah, be careful praying for patience because he'll never just give it to you. He's going to put you through trying things and he's going to test your patience like never before. How do you get more patient? You have to practice being patient. Tell God, thank you, God, for what you're teaching me in this season. Listen to Psalm 25. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. You know what kind of attitude you have to be in to, to cry out to God in the middle of pain and say, teach me. That's humility. That's openness. That's the kind of person you and I want to be. Teach me, oh God. Thank you for teaching me through this season. I hate it, but thank you. It's okay to say that. He's not offended by that. He's your best friend. He already knows you hate it. What he wants for you is to be real to him as you talk to him. Spend time in the word and in the scripture with him. Teach me, for you are a God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. And the third thing you got to do, and I got to do, is tell God, thank you for going with me through whatever it is I'm going through. Listen to this passage. Joshua 1, 9 says, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Lord your God is with you. Where does it say? Wherever. That's a power word. Wherever you go, he is with you. Listen to Psalm 139. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Always with you. You know the very last sentence Jesus spoke? If you haven't read the Bible, it says he's up on the Mount of Olives. He's, res he's resurrected from the dead. He's appeared and he keeps kind of scaring people. His cool stories in there. He just shows up and people are like, well... You know, and, and he has a sense of humor, I think God does. And his last scene, he literally tells, go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden, it says he just begins to lift. He takes off. And today he's seated back in what I call his gated community. And he's waiting for the Father to send him back. But the last thing he said as he was going back to his Father and sending the Holy Spirit, he said, and be sure of this. I am with you always. You can thank God in the circumstance, in the season that you're going through. 
It'll help you be a better person. You can thank God that he's trying to teach you something if you and I will open our ears and our hearts. And you can absolutely thank God that no matter what, he never leaves you alone. He's with you always. And really the church, us, it, it scares me that you might come in here and sit by yourself and not know anybody. You have no reason to be ashamed or nervous. I promise you, I would never judge you. And if you come in here and you start to develop some companionship and one of these awesome, what I think awesome church members begins to mistreat you or judge you and gossip, let me know. They, everybody around here knows I have no problem speaking the truth and cracking the whip on people who are not behaving biblically. This is a place where you can be safe, where you can have God walking with you always. And we can be a place where we go into this community and man, I'm telling you, 27 years of ministry, this is not, this is not me. I've been, I've been criticized for saying these kind of things. This town is special. You know what I mean by that? This town is full of very successful people who do not like being told what to do. And this town has their act together when it comes to the secular world. And what this town needs more than anything is to drop its facades that everybody's got it all together because nobody has it all together. Stop faking it if you are and come in here and make this your church home and let me encourage and challenge you and then there's going to be times where I'm down and out and I need you to encourage and challenge me. Man, let's not play church where we just show up and we sing some songs and hear a half-decent message that goes too long and then we go back out just to repeat next Sunday. I'm out if that's the case. I have no desire. I'd rather go work in a mortuary with my wife. You know? Really? Let's be the church, people. A lot of the people in this second service, you're newer in here coming and checking us out, and you're part of a new era of Christ Church of me coming in and getting to be a, the lead pastor and take us into the next 20 years. Would you build with me? I'm, I'm not, I can handle empty seats, but next week there needs to be at least one more person, and the next week there needs to be at least one more person because Jesus is coming back, and there's all kinds of things we can go through in life, but man, we're so much better together, and I love the fact that there's so much that we can learn when we're in the hallways, when we're stuck and we feel like life just sucks. There's so many things we can be thankful for. Thank you for this season, Lord. Thank you that you're teaching me something. And by God, by God, thank you that I am never, ever alone. You're always with me. Last thing, God's good all the time, everybody. He really is. And God's timing is perfect, period. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. Lord, keep bringing us together as a church. we got a lot of work to do. Help us to drop our facades and help us to help people in this community to drop their facades. And that we're just a place where we can be real with each other and accept each other in all of our weirdness, all of our problems, and that we just work together each and every day to get a little bit better in your name. Represent you a little bit better. Thank you, God. We love you. Thank you for our time together today. May our world be better as we get ready to scatter right now and represent you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week, everybody. If I can pray with anybody, encourage anybody, find me. I'm just wandering around here for the next time. <laughs>